Popular or other music. Yes. Okay. I will copy so the video here. Copy the video. I will copy now. Ah, okay. You test it? Test the sound? Yeah. Trying to put the sound. It's not coming up. But you need to start the video. It's already going on. She's speaking here. Mm. Ah. So, sorry. So, how do we put on the sound? We're just testing the, the video. Yeah, the video has been copied, but the sound doesn't work. Hast du da was? and small um, renewable electrification projects can act as vehicles for industrialization and long-term base capabilities build. Mine is green windows opportunity in green hydrogen. <laughs> This is the problem. <laughs> I will have to check. Okay. If there are questions, thank you.
Okay. Yeah. So welcome, colleagues. Um, we we start now this side event on green windows of opportunity in green uh, economy. So windows of opportunity in green economy. Um, and we understand that this uh, side event um, is also being uh, transmitted live through different platforms and will be available. Yeah, it's being transmitted that I just got the feedback <laughs> and will be available um, later on to be uh, assessed also through these platforms. So uh, my name is Clovis Freire. I'm an um, economic affairs officer at the United Nations Conference on Trade and, F and Development, UNCTAD. And uh, I have also here my colleagues. So I have uh, Roberta Rabelote, is professor at the University of Pavia. We have um, Rasmus Lema, is associate professor at UNU, UNU Merit. We will also have Akio Takemoto, head of program and administration of, of UNU ISA, IAS. And uh, we will have uh, also a presentation of a colleague, um, Rebecca Hallin. She's from the uh, ACTS, African Centre for Technology Studies. This side event is being uh, organized by UNU Merit, ACTS, TS and ACTAD and University of Pavia. So, um, I'll, without further ado, we'll start uh, the first, uh, the motivation of this, um, this discussion on windows of opportunity in this green economy. So let me share a presentation. So to, to start this discussion, um, we, the idea is that we have these two imperatives to eradicate poverty and to tackle climate change. So if we go back to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we have at the beginning that we recognize that eradicating poverty is in all its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest, the greatest global challenge and indispensable for sustainable development. So eliminating poverty is on the top there of the challenge that we have globally. But also we have to take urgent action on climate change. So why is this uh, a challenge? Well, because we see that as countries grow, as incomes increase, the usually we have this associated with higher CO2 emissions. So if we are talking about uh, reducing poverty, reducing inequalities, and uh, inequalities between countries and bringing people to a standard of living that is uh, at a higher level, these countries will have to produce more, transport more, consume more, and will be um, inevitably putting more CO2 in the atmosphere. So. Uh, you see that this association is quite strong, but we do have some kind of curve that people call the environmental cuts net curve. So at some point uh, later on in the level of development, maybe you have countries that uh, uh, reduce their level of CO2 emissions per capita. But uh, you see that overall there is this strong tendency to, to have one increase and the other. So how to deal with this with this paradox, right? So is there a mechanism behind to bring down this, this curve? So to have this environment cousinets curve, while as you increase the income, you reduce CO2 emissions. Well, what makes the CO2 emissions increases that the scale effect, right? You have higher supply, higher demand, you are producing more, you are consuming more. So that's, we'll put more emissions there as incomes grow. What are things that could reduce that? One is trade effect when you move the dirty production to developing countries. Well, that, that may uh, help developed countries, but overall, uh, globally, you are not changing much, right? And just putting the dirt, dirty production in developing countries. Um, 
The second one is demand and policy effects. So because you have the demand, increased demand for a cleaner planet. So then you have environmental regulations. Through the demand, you have regulations such as emissions charge, subsidies, emission standards, and so on. This demand change and policy change, they also push, push uh, generate the need for changes in process and product. So then you have the innovation technological effect. You change process in a way you are producing in a more effective way, requires less inputs, diminished pollution. You are producing new products that are more environmentally friendly, or you are changing the structure of the economy. So at the end of the day, innovation and technology are essential to this transformation, are essential for this transformation. And these technologies that are including renewable technologies, but also digital technologies, advanced digital technologies like AI or IoT that use in, in the industry 4.0, can bring also greener some sectors. You see that these are frontier technologies, but are already uh, very significant technology in the market is estimated at $1.5 trillion in 2020, up to 2000, uh, 2030 trillion, uh, in 2030, $9.2 trillion market for this technology. So big uh, growth of this technology. So uh, technology innovation essential. These technologies are being used, being produced. There is a market for that. Let's bring them to, to um, the environmental aspect. So what is the big problem? Well, the problem is that historically, technological revolutions are associated with increasing inequality. What is showing this graph is that in, before the Industrial Revolution, the GDP uh, the real GDP per capita in the developed countries and developing countries were basically the same. There was very low um, disparities there. But after the, after the Industrial Revolution, you have this uh, um, uh, orange line that represents developed countries going up their GDP per capita, and the blue line is the rest of countries. That is very low, so you have this big gap. And that you see associated with each one of these technological revolutions. So the problem is that if we are going through a new technological revolution that is required for this green transformation, how can we do that without leaving countries behind? How to make, how to avoid that this new technological revolution continues increasing this gap between countries. The thing is that technological revolutions, they also offer opportunities for countries to catch up. And here I'm showing these two waves of, of technological change, the age of ICT and the industry 4.0. So one can argue that we are the, at the maturity phase of the age of ICT, uh, countries have are uh, going uh, already um, at the end of that uh, age of ICT, and now is starting uh, a Industry 4.0 um, technological revolution. The thing is, in the past technolog technological revolutions, historically, this initial phase of a technological revolution was the time where few countries were able to catch up. During the fourth industrial revol in the technological revolution, mass production, US and German were able to catch up with UK. During the fa initial phase of the fifth industrial re technological revolution, countries in Asia were able to catch up by linking themselves in, in value chains related to digital technologies of the age of ICT. So is there, is there a way for countries now, not only using these green technologies to tackle climate change, but also to reduce the technological and income gap between countries. The question then is this, how to avoid the repetition of the patterns of previous waves of technological change in which most developed countries lag behind, and how international community can foster this green innovation while reducing inequalities between countries? Well, we, we can think about that. Uh, I bring this conceptual framework to see how we can tackle these questions in so many ways. But basically, what I'm showing here is that if we, if we are talking about inequalities and we consider inequalities 
within countries in inequalities between countries, we will see that these inequalities can be uh, uh, related to many factors, but one of them is related to what people do for a living, and that is related to jobs, wages, are related to profits, and that is related to the technologies that exist in the economy that allow those jobs to be in that economy, so these sectors to be in that economy. And if you have some of these technologies of, that are green technologies, of green innovation, so some of these jobs that will be created in that economy will be related to those green technologies, green innovation. So we can look at this uh, issue of inequalities and green technologies on this production lens, and we also can look at this, uh, the user lens, how these green technologies or products that use these green technologies can be used by people and how they help to, to tackle climate change at the user level, at the consumption level. There is a lot of study already how technology can be used to tackle climate change in the user perspective. How by using uh, energy that is greener, that is solar energy, you are reducing the carbon footprint. How using products that are greener or that you can recycle, you have a, you, you are uh, protecting the environment. There is a lot of studies on that. But what we'd like to focus is how by producing these technologies, by using these technologies in production process, countries can not only help to protect the planet, but also can grow faster and can catch up um, technologically and, and economically. So we will, on that, we, the idea of this whole discussion is to focus on this effect of green innovation through the production lens. We are doing, uh, in UNCTAD, we are preparing a, tech, uh, a report on technology innovation that is exactly on that, those green windows of opportunity for developing countries to catch up technologically and economically through green technology and innovation. And in this uh, analytical work, we are focused on how can they can do that through the production of green technologies, through the application of frontier technologies like AI, IoT, robots, to greener global value chains, and also through diversifying economies through a, towards a sectors with lower carbon footprints. Because uh, most low-income countries, they are very commodity dependent, dependent on manufacturing of low value added, so they need to diversify their, their economies, how they can do that through sectors that have a lower carbon footprint. The focus today on this discussion will be very much on this first one. What are the opportunities in the production of green technologies. So with that, I will now like to invite uh, Roberta Rabelotti to talk us about, tell us about these windows of opportunity, green windows of opportunity in the production of this technology. Roberta. Okay, so <clears throat> good afternoon uh, and thank you for being here. Um, yes, my presentation uh, is going to uh, follow what uh, <clears throat> Clovis uh, has just uh, um, started to introduce. Um, I'm going uh, to focus on um, the analytical framework to investigate uh, uh, green windows of opportunity. And uh, what I'm presenting is uh, 
uh, a work uh, um, we uh, did in co I did in collaboration with uh, Rasmus Lema um, on behalf of UNCTAD and uh, for the preparation of this uh, of the next uh, technology and innovation uh, uh, report. So let me start from uh, uh, the framework. Um, do we really need a new framework uh, to investigate uh, uh, green windows of opportunity and to investigate uh, how latecomer countries uh, uh, could size uh, uh, green windows of opportunity? According to us, the answer is yes, we do need uh, a new framework. Uh, and this is because, uh, uh, first of all, um, it is very important uh, that the traditional model of development, uh, which can be summarized uh, uh, with growth first and clean up later uh, should be, is not any more sustainable. And secondly, uh, it is important that latecomer countries um, start to uh, move on uh, toward the green transition, uh, not uh, catching up uh, along established pathways, but uh, um, following a, a new model of growth. So um, the green windows of opportunity framework is based on three different pillars. Uh, the first one uh, uh, is green windows of opportunities, uh, um, and I'm going to explain you in a moment what is the specificity of these green windows of opportunities. The second pillar is uh, um, the characteristics of the sectoral system of production and innovation, and the third pillar uh, is uh, um, characterized by the catch-up tra trajectory. So how the interaction between green windows of opportunities and the the characteristic of this sectoral system do, um, uh, uh, do uh, produce uh, different kind of catch-up uh, trajectories. And what I'm going to uh, do is to uh, present these three different pillars and provide you, uh, you with some empirical evidence which we have been collected for uh, uh, this new uh, technology and innovation UNCTAD report, uh, which is based on uh, um, countries uh, at different level of development and uh, on different industries, uh, mainly uh, renewable energy industries uh, and uh, um, electrical uh, uh, vehicles. So green windows of opportunity. Do, what do we mean for green windows of opportunity? Um, green, the specificity of green windows of opportunity is that they are mainly endogenous. So they are created uh, by uh, government and could be influenced by domestic and global environmental and industrial policies. And this is quite different from windows of opportunity um, which have been studied in uh, different industries, uh, in, in the catch-up trajectories of different industries, uh, different uh, um, di uh, industries as different as, for instance, mobile phones or uh, uh, steel. Uh, because generally, these windows of opportunity for latecomer development have been uh, um, exogenous, uh, so mainly based on uh, technological changes or uh, uh, changes uh, in external uh, market demand. In the case of green windows of opportunity, examples could be, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, 2006 uh, renewable energy promotion law in China, China or uh, some demonstration programs uh, like the Golden Sun or uh, the Ride the Wind uh, program. But there are uh, examples from other countries too, like uh, uh, from Brazil, for instance, the, um, the program for uh, sugarcane-based uh, ethanol uh, fuel, or uh, in India, the um, 2020 National Electric Mobility Mission Plan. And then, uh, more recently, the many different uh, green hydrogen strategies uh, which have been promoted or are uh, on, um, on the pro on, in progress in many different uh, latecomer countries. So, um, but of course, green windows of opportunity need to be sized. So it's not enough to have windows of opportunity. You need to be able to exploit uh, them. And here uh, it comes the second uh, pillar of our uh, framework, uh, which is uh, um, the uh, sec uh, which is basically the characteristics of the sectoral systems uh, of production and innovation. And here we would like to distinguish between uh, the existing 
existing preconditions and uh, the uh, responses uh, at the level of firms uh, and uh, at the level of other public and private uh, actors. And uh, we also uh, would like to emphasize the, um, the fact that uh, these uh, uh, um, six sectoral systems and the responses uh, are very different depending on the different technological maturity uh, of the technologies and uh, the different readability. So uh, the kind of responses uh, needed uh, to develop uh, a, a sectoral system for, uh, uh, for instance, concentrated solar power, which is a relatively new technology, is very different from uh, the kind of uh, sectoral system is needed for the development of uh, solar PV uh, or for uh, um, uh, uh, the wind uh, industry. Um, and uh, in order to uh, investigate the, um, these differences, uh, uh, the different kind of uh, sectoral systems uh, needed, um, we have emphasized uh, uh, these two dimensions of the sectoral system, which are preconditions and responses. And here you can see a matrix uh, we propose uh, in which we take into account uh, the um, existence of uh, uh, strong, uh, rather weak uh, preconditions uh, uh, and on the other side of strong or uh, weak uh, uh, responses. And as you can see, there are four possible scenarios. The first one uh, is the one in which both uh, preconditions are strong and responses are uh, strong. Uh, then there is a second scenario in which uh, uh, Precondition could be strong, but there are uh, relatively weak uh, um, uh, responses. And then uh, a third scenario in which uh, uh, precondition could be weak, but responses are quite uh, uh, active. And finally, a, a less uh, um, uh, awful scenario in which uh, both precondition and uh, um, uh, uh, responses are weak. And so I just very briefly present you some evidence about uh, these different scenarios, um, uh, considering the first scenario, which is the most, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, positive. Um, for instance, uh, uh, we can consider the case of China, in which preconditions uh, uh, tend to be quite good uh, in different industries. Uh, and this is due to the fact that, first of all, as we know, uh, China has a very large internal market, uh, has also a very diversified uh, industrial structure and well uh, uh, developed <clears throat> well-developed capabilities. Uh, so all these are contributed to build up strong preconditions which are favorable in terms of developing uh, further uh, um, uh, different uh, sectoral systems in different industries. In terms of responses, again, China, uh, we can see uh, uh, many different cases in which uh, China has been uh, very good in terms of co-designing uh, environmental and industrial policy. Uh, China um, has been, for instance, in the case of uh, solar PV and biomass, uh, um, uh, very active uh, in terms of uh, acquiring uh, uh, foreign technologies through licensing or even through the uh, direct acquisition of foreign uh, firms. And in sectors uh, which are more, uh, which are less mature, like for instance CSP, uh, there has been a lot of effort in terms of building up uh, demonstration program and in terms of investing in public uh, R&D. Uh, but it's not only the case of China. For instance, in the case of uh, uh, Brazil, uh, a lot of effort had been put uh, in terms of uh, building up uh, technological capacity uh, in uh, the um, uh, sugar and ethanol uh, uh, industries. Um, the case of miss, uh, uh, missed opportunity. So strong precondition and weak uh, um, weak uh, responses. This is, for instance, the case of uh, uh, the solar industry in, uh, um, in India, in which uh, the prior prioritization of uh, a, a deployment based on low cost has been quite, uh, um, uh, has, has had a negative effect in terms of developing a uh, domestic industrial capacity. Uh, and when, uh, at a certain point, uh, there were 
uh, there was the introduction of uh, some local content requirements, uh, these were not effective because uh, the, um, there was a lack of domestic business capacity uh, uh, created uh, um, in the early stages. A similar case is uh, Bangladesh uh, in the biomass, a lot of investment in public R&D, but very little incentives uh, to um, invest, uh, to private investment in, uh, um, in uh, um, creating uh, biogas uh, plant uh, installations. Um, and finally, uh, a, a, a very interesting, a number of very interesting cases in the scenario number three, in which we have relatively weak precondition, but a very active uh, approach. And this is, for instance, the case of Thailand, uh, which has been very active in terms of uh, creating the condition for private investment in the biogas uh, industry through financial subsidies, through tax incentives, uh, and uh, uh, also creating a, a, a favorable uh, tariff uh, program. Uh, another interesting case is Ethiopia uh, in the wind industry, uh, in which there was uh, the enforcement of uh, a collaboration between the private investor, investors and the local uh, uh, universities in, uh, to, to um, create the condition to build up domestic uh, capacity. So let me come to the third uh, pillar, um, which is trajectories. Uh, here you can see um, the uh, trajectories we have uh, identified, uh, in this case, uh, for China and for five uh, industry, uh, solar, PV, wind, um, biomass, uh, and uh, uh, concentrated solar power. We measure catch-up uh, on the vertical axis, uh, axis based on uh, uh, market, uh, distinguishing, uh, distinguishing between domestic market and global market. And on the horizontal axis, uh, we measure technological catch-up, uh, so distinguishing between new to the country technology and world-class uh, technologies. And as you can see, the different industry have been following very different trajectories. Uh, but what is interesting to see is that uh, uh, apart from wind, all the other industries have been able to catch up both from the market point of view and from uh, the technological uh, point of view. And just uh, I, 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 I would like just to give you an idea about uh, one of these trajectory, the Chinese, the, the solar PV trajectory, which is quite interesting because uh, um, the Chinese uh, industry uh, started uh, um, to, uh, to export based on uh, foreign technologies. Uh, but when uh, um, the uh, global demand uh, fallen, uh, there was a big fall in, the, in global demand because of the financial crisis, what Chinese uh, uh, companies did was to come back to China and to start to produce for the Chinese uh, market thanks to some incentive created uh, uh, by the state. And at the same time, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, effort in terms of building up a very uh, lively and very strong uh, innovation and production uh, um, ecosystem. And when uh, the uh, Chinese companies reached the technological uh, frontier, they started to get back again uh, to the international market and to export in the international market. And as we know now, two-thirds of the uh, solar panels uh, sold in the global market come from uh, uh, China. So uh, key takeaways from this, uh, um, from this uh, um, study, uh, new green windows of opportunities are open uh, mainly by policy changing, changes. Uh, the sizing of green windows of opportunity uh, depends on country precondition um, and there is significant variability in the catch-up trajectories at the center, uh, sector and country uh, level. And tradability and technological maturity are key in explaining the variability of uh, uh, these catch-up uh, trajectories. So, um, policy implication, do we still have time? Okay, so policy implication, um, here uh, I think that there are two uh, uh, main dimensions of the policy implication. Uh, first, uh, um, there are 
policy, in, uh, policies which are needed in order to open and uh, augment uh, uh, green windows of opportunity, and there are policies which are needed in order to assess, address, and sustain the development of the sectoral system needed to size uh, green windows of opportunity. Uh, there are a number of policy instruments which, are, uh, uh, which can be used for these two um, uh, uh, different policy objectives, and I, I don't have the time to enter into uh, these uh, uh, different uh, and to discuss these different policy instruments. But I would like to conclude uh, with something which I think is very important, uh, in particular today, uh, because uh, what it comes out from our uh, uh, research is that there is a, a huge um, important uh, policy space for uh, international organizations like uh, the UN uh, for uh, sustaining uh, institutional change-led uh, mission-oriented uh, green windows of opportunity, mm -hmm. facilitating the entry in the global market of new countries uh, in the green economy. And, and, and this is also um, will uh, drive a uh, diversity of green uh, pathways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta. So now we, we went zoom in into this green window of opportunity uh, in this um, renewable energy. And we'll go zoom in further with the case of green hydrogen. So I uh, invite uh, Rasmus to, to make a presentation on how uh, the green hydrogen uh, industry presents a green window of opportunity for some countries. Uh, yes, um, thank you, uh, Clovis. <clears throat> uh, before starting, I also just want to uh, again thank uh, all of you for um, helping organize this. And I also think we should uh, thank Michael Cisner from the United Nations University, who was really instrumental in, in uh, setting up this uh, panel. So um, as Clovis said, uh, we've had a, a, a zooming out perspective, and now we're going to zoom in first uh, with a bit of discussion of where are opportunities in, in green hydrogen. Uh, after that, uh, Rebecca Handlin from, from ACTS in a pre-recorded um, video will be talking about uh, solar and wind uh, uh, projects in, in the East African uh, context. So um, let me jump uh, straight into to the presentation. So um, both Clovis and, and Roberta have been talking about how the green transition uh, is a techno-economic paradigm transition with specific characteristics that sets it apart from uh, other uh, types of, of transitions uh, earlier in, in history. Um, and and um, I'm sure all of, this, uh, all of us in this room are very well aware that in that uh, uh, green transformation, a green hydrogen will, will play a very important role um, in, in, in uh, constituting and, and shaping technological trajectories. Um, especially in, in so-called uh, hard-to-abate sectors, such as uh, cement and steel, uh, also in uh, energy, uh, in terms of uh, uh, transportation, uh, aviation, um, um, uh, shipping, and, and so forth. So um, green hydrogen uh, economies are, are being planned, are underway. Um, they could const constitute uh, and, and cater for something like 20% of, of energy demand in, in 2050, so a substantial part of, of the green um, economy which is, is developing. Uh, so, of course, the, the question uh, that we've been raising is where and how um, could, could this present green windows of opportunity, and specifically here, of course, what are where uh, are the opportunities in, in green hydrogen. And basically, what we uh, had done, um, and this is what was explained for this uh, Ongta Technology Innovation Report 2020, uh, we did a bit of a, a literature survey on some of the other sectors that we've 
I've been studying, there's much more uh, literature out there uh, in terms of uh, published academic literature. For, for green hydrogen, uh, there's not so much because it's still an emerging field, so we've been drawing quite a lot on uh, policy reports uh, and roadmaps uh, from across the world. Um, and, and in fact, we also draw on the recent uh, uh, session at the UN STI forum in which we were discussing uh, green hydrogen. So uh, we're still uh, finalizing the report, so uh, it's also an, an input to, to that. So the key questions, uh, very quickly, does the green hydrogen economy offer uh, windows of opportunity? Uh, what policy questions and dilemmas uh, are present for developing countries in the efforts to take uh, advantage of these uh, opportunities? And what may characterize the capacity of developing countries to, to seize the opportunities? Now, um, uh, just starting uh, with uh, uh, the potential and um, what we could call the opening of a significant demand window uh, in um, in the green economy, as, as was uh, discussed, many of the green windows are endogenous, but really this demand window, which is developing, uh, is of a very exogenous um, character and, and very market-driven. So uh, what this slide shows is that we are uh, on the verge within the next uh, 10 to 15 years to reach price parity with uh, um, a blue hydrogen, so that's uh, hydrogen from uh, fossil fuels with carbon uh, capture and, and storage. Now, already now, uh, we see that the cheapest uh, uh, green hydrogen produced from the cheapest wind and solar sources uh, are almost on the verge of, of reaching price parity. Um, but, you know, over the next uh, 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 10 to 15 years, uh, a price of $2.5 uh, uh, per, per kilo um, will make it competitive. And this is when, uh, of course, the, the big market shift will, will start to move. So who can uh, cater for, for this significant demand there will be? And uh, what uh, this slide then shows is the technical potential uh, for producing uh, green hydrogen under one and a half dollars uh, per, per kilo in, in uh, 2050. And of course, what can be seen here is that uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's uh, a substantial, substantial technical potential also in, in the Middle East, um, in Latin America, uh, in, in places like uh, um, uh, Brazil and elsewhere. There are also um, um, significant potentials and, and plans uh, uh, underway. Now, of course, we uh, have to take these uh, measures with uh, some interpretation because uh, the technical potential uh, is, uh, is indeed technical and there's loads of, um, of bottlenecks that need to be uh, removed before uh, this can um, be turned into to reality. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we do see that you know, for, for a lot of uh, countries in the global south, this is uh, a significant uh, opportunity. So then uh, thinking about you know, where uh, exactly then are these uh, opportunities, it's quite useful to think uh, of the green uh, hydrogen sector in terms of its uh, input and output structure. Um, and basically, uh, we can think about the... the um, the core of the green hydrogen economy, so to speak, and the backward and, and the forward links. So, uh, of course, in, in terms of renewables, uh, uh, preparing for uh, the coming, coming hydrogen economy, investing um, in competitive renewable energy industries, uh, raising finance, and, uh, and achieving economies of scale uh, around uh, renewable energy is... Uh, is one strategy and, and one area for, uh, for attention. Uh, in terms of the green hydrogen economy itself, uh, then, of course, uh, the, the, the point is about uh, a green, green hydrogen uh, exports, and I uh, will say green hydrogen exports potentially, uh, as, as I will um, get back to. Uh, but, of course, um, uh, that is uh, a first step. Um, in, in a second step, uh, also... Uh, uh, following from that, we have uh, exports of transformed uh, outputs uh, in terms of uh, fertilizers, uh, ammonia, and, and different fuels, and so on. And then we have, uh, um, um, in, in a later step, green hydrogen technology exports, so uh, exporting uh, fertil um, 
uh, electrolyzer facilities, uh, and so on. So, for instance, uh, again, coming back to China, uh, this is some of the, uh, a space where China is very active, and indeed a space where, where uh, China is also quite uh, cost competitive uh, compared to a uh, European and, and US solution. Then, of course, there's also opportunities uh, in the forward links. So, uh, what we could call competitiveness in decarbonized uh, production. So, uh, um, in terms of industry, we're already seeing that, for instance, uh, automakers are uh, um, uh, locating some of their processes uh, in, in green hydrogen uh, um, um, locations, because then you can uh, reduce the, the total carbon footprint of, of these auto parts, which will be an increasingly uh, important factor for, uh, for the um, electric vehicle uh, industry. Uh, also, in, in terms of uh, transportation, uh, thinking about uh, the Middle East sustaining its uh, position as a global transportation hub with, uh, with jet fuels, um, um, and so on. So there are really you know, different uh, spaces in which um, one can um, turn attention. But of course, uh, the big issue here is about you know, exactly where and, and how to select across uh, uh, these types of spaces. So there are uh, very important um, strategic uh, choices here. So um, just to, to start thinking about uh, those questions a little bit, uh, as Roberta already mentioned, um, we've been looking into uh, a range of different sectors and looking at sectoral characteristics, not least in terms of these dimensions, so their tradability and, and their technological uh, maturity, uh, to see how that um, uh, affects these industrial uh, dynamics. And for, for, for green hydrogen, uh, what is uh, important to take uh, into account is that, of course, um, a, 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 a big uh, sort of underlying assumption uh, in all of these discussions is that we will eventually have high tradability of, of output. So we can transport uh, green hydrogen across the globe, uh, unlike uh, electricity, um, because it can be shipped, but of course that requires investments in, in development of, uh, of these ships. It will uh, come eventually, but, but we're not quite there. Also, a lot of other um, uh, um, infrastructure investments uh, are required. So um, uh, it, it enables export of natural resource based, uh, resources based on imported technology. Uh, depending on preconditions, it can support a rapid expansion of renewables and requires investments, as I said, in infrastructure. But uh, there's a huge, uh, of course, danger here that what we are then uh, developing is green hydrogen as a kind of uh, uh, enclave activity. Uh, and it's very likely that a lot of uh, at least the initial uh, projects and investment investments will be of that type, extremely capital intensive, uh, with very low uh, uh, local job creation, uh, um, um, so not exporting any, uh, anything else than the, the, the commodity itself. Now, of course, um, what we want to do is we want to diversify and, and build on this uh, in, in dynamic terms, as I was uh, mentioning. And here, then, uh, it's important to look at you know, what's then the nature of the, the technology. And the technology itself, uh, if we're thinking about the core te technology around uh, um, electrolyzers and you know, uh, how that uh, connects um, uh, backward and forward, uh, we have a very low tradability. So that means, uh, in connection to what I was just saying, that we will have uh, globalization in this sector with uh, uh, a lot of foreign direct investments. It's not like you can put an uh, electrolyzer on a, on a ship and, and transport it somewhere, unlike a solar panel. So that creates um, a completely different dynamics. And it also creates dynamics in which you will have spaces and options for tapping into to the value chain. It's extremely difficult to tap into some other top types of value chains uh, where everything is manufactured you know, off-site. But here there will be spaces, so the trick is, of course, then to uh, understand the value chain, understand how you can uh, uh, build on uh, catering for some parts of it and, and, and to other parts of it. So in that sense, uh, some of this industrial dynamic is, is not unlike, uh, for instance, hydropower or, um, um, uh, or, or large-scale wind power. Then, of course, uh, we have low technological maturity. It's still a de developing space. 
Um, uh, so it requires, uh, from, from the policy perspective, attention to investment in, in, in local research and development. Um, and also in terms of this technological maturity, of course, what is interesting here is that it's, it's, it's a space that's developing. So uh, uh, countries that are engaging in this sector at the moment will have opportunities to shape the technological trajectory uh, in ways that uh, are not possible in already uh, established trajectories. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, summarize here and, um, um, and move on. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the, the key message from here is that green hydrogen is a very important uh, opportunity. It's, it's, it's stemming from this expected uh, significant demand window, uh, factor endowments across the uh, global south with a big potential for renewables, and uh, what I was talking about uh, then the most, the potential dynamic uh, effects of, of the green hydrogen sector that, that makes it uh, a kind of augmented uh, green window of opportunity. Uh, in terms of the responses, uh, um, the, 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 the GVO, uh, it needs to be tailored to the preconditions and associated opportunities uh, in terms of industrial structure. As I said, uh, there are uh, many different spaces and uh, not all of the spaces can be occupied at once. So where should you, uh, uh, should you focus? And are there then dangers for, of establishing, uh, you could say, unfavorable technological trajectories of the enclave part that that creates uh, uh, um, um, sorts of lock-in. But nevertheless, as I mentioned, just to recapitulate, uh, uh, um, recapitulate there's uh, opportunities in core technologies uh, around electrolysis and infrastructure, backward linkages to renewables, forward linkages to industry, transport, and agriculture. Um, and in terms of uh, the, the sort of policy conditions, uh, I didn't then uh, talk too much about that. Uh, but in this green hydrogen sector, there are extraordinary requirements for cross-sexual uh, coordination and joint design of policies. Now, uh, Roberta already talked about the importance of combining uh, industrial and environmental and energy policies together so that it works in uniform. But in this sector, there's also uh, uh, coordination requirements uh, across the value chains in very different uh, technological and economic spaces at once. So this is really, uh, in terms of government capacity, uh, um, uh, very demanding uh, and something that, that we need to be aware of. Um, of course, uh, global partnerships are needed to turn many uh, of these opportunities uh, into reality. Um, and there are already, uh, of course, north-south global uh, partnerships uh, uh, um, uh, being developed, uh, including uh, EU, uh, South Africa, uh, a just transition uh, partnership around uh, green hydrogen. Um, the message from here is that these types of partnerships are, are very much needed because um, basically spreading the gains, the economic gains from the green transformation is, is necessary to uh, sustain popular, popular legitimacy and enabling and, and uh, assisting uh, Global South countries in addressing these green windows is absolutely uh, important in, in, in that respect. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Perhaps you can go along and already play the the presentation of um, Rebecca. Which one is it? Is it something? Ah, but it should already be open. There it is. So if I just... It's not on the screen now. No. Uh, I have, to, to, close I have the, to share this one. Uh, this one. <coughs> now I'm sharing... Do you want to share the video? Yeah. yeah okay. So I, I guess it's just... No, it's not showing. Yeah, but it's because it's delayed. No, it's mm. the PowerPoint in the back. PowerPoint is still. I'll stop presenting. Yeah, it's on the screen now. Yeah, but not on the meeting. Hello, 
My name is Rebecca Hanlin and I'm joining you today from Kenya um, and the African Centre for Technology Studies. I'm going to present the results from a Danida funded project that some of the other panel members were involved in and that ran from 2015 to 2021 and it focused on innovation efforts within renewable electrification activities in Kenya with an aim to inform policies that lead to employment opportunities, income generation and household access to electricity. The project findings are provided in a book that was published last year by EarthScan and in the project we were particularly interested in what we term economic co-benefits and particularly those benefits, those co-benefits in relation to sustainable industrialization, specifically localized economic activity and capability building. The starting point for the work that we did in this project, uh, which we uh, have termed IREC, um, Innovation for Renewable Electrification in Kenya, so IREC for short. The starting point for this work was to focus at the level of the project and how large infrastructure and small um, renewable electrification projects can act as vehicles for industrialization and long-term base capabilities building. We were interested not just in how projects are used to create access to energy as a result, but also what longer term impact they have on the economy in terms of the skills that they built and what this means for industrialization efforts in Kenya. And we draw a lot on work that examines um, the role of infrastructure projects in building economies as a result and in discussions on the importance of industrial policy. And I won't go through any of that now, but you can see on the slides uh, some of the theories and, uh, and concepts that we have used in, in the project. We used a case study approach uh, in this part of the project that I'm going to discuss uh, with you today. And we looked at two small and, and two larger projects that focused on wind and solar technologies in Kenya. So we looked at Lake Tulkana Wind Project and Garissa Solar Park, which are two large scale projects. And then we looked at Kitunyoni Solar Project and Mombasa SOS Children's Village, both solar projects, but on a smaller scale. And we looked at the whole spectrum of a project. So we looked from the design stage to the build stage to the operate and transfer stage. Um, and we asked four specific research questions, but with two that are the focus of the discussion today. And those two relate to whether um, the location of a firm and, and where a firm is operated in the project makes a difference in terms of the skills and capabilities that they, that they acquired through participating in the project and what the impact of the firm's involvement in the project was. Notably, did it lead to some form of value addition for, for the firm? To answer these questions, we collected information through interviews with firms involved in all four projects and through a thorough desk review of different documents and sources. And we looked at evidence of different types of skills, capability building and upgrading as outlined in this table. So we were interested in questions in relation to individual skills in terms of what skills were acquired what, and, and through what training opportunities and what were the government minimum standards for such training and skills. In terms of technological capabilities, we were interested in new physical technologies, such as new pieces of equipment that were introduced into the firm. Um, we were interested in new knowledge that was introduced into the firm as a result of new business opportunities um, at different stages of, of the project cycle. In terms of core competences, we were interested in whether firms acted um, as an EPC uh, contractor so whether they performed a, uh, a, a holistic function in relation to engineering, procurement and construction. 
And we also wanted to understand the degree to which they leverage new partnerships on the back of, of the previous work. So the degree to which involvement in projects led to new projects and new, uh, and new partnerships. And we were therefore interested in the, the, the end results, the outcomes of these projects and whether it led to future activity in relation to upgrading. So whether it led to process upgrading, so increased efficiency, for example, in processes, whether it led to product upgrading, so um, whether it, it led to a movement from, from using, say, Chinese inverters to German inverters, whether it led to functional upgrading, so moving from a contractor with one activity within the project to doing full EPC activities, and whether it led to chain upgrading. So uh, whether we, we saw people uh, and companies moving from installing uh, one particular type of equipment to, to a whole different type of, of equipment. Um, now, in terms of major findings, we find that local companies benefited in all projects, but that what we call business unusual only occurred in small scale projects. And what we mean here is that while some local firms did invest in new technology and brought new knowledge and capabilities into their firm, smaller firms did more of this and grew capabilities across the spectrum of areas that we looked at. So, for example, we found that Kenya has developed uh, several firms that have moved from being uh, small contractors on projects to full EPC firms in, uh, in the space of just three years. And uh, we find that, um, that large firms were involved in business as usual. So they might invest heavily in new equipment, but the activities that they did tended not to change from one project to another, that they were known for providing a particular type of service or product um, within a project, and, and they did that across multiple projects um, in uh, across the uh, a time different time zone uh, different time frames. Second, we found that jobs uh, were created through all four projects, but many were short term. And we also found that most jobs were created in the solar PV area due to the dominance of this technology um, in Kenya, especially at the small scale. What we didn't expect to find, but was very reassuring, was that many projects started thinking that they would rely on external expertise, but found that they could use Kenyan labor, especially in terms of engineering. So um, this was particularly the case uh, for Lake Turkana wind project, where the foreign um, large company that was providing the technology, um, Vestas, um, uh, um, the wind uh, turbine manufacturer, felt that it would need to bring in um, engineers from abroad to, uh, to, 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 run, them, to run the machines um, to run the turbines and, and to uh, set them up. Um, and in fact, they ended up being able to recruit Kenyan engineers and uh, there are now very few expatriate uh, engineers in, involved in the project. Um, what we did find there was, was where jobs and skills were created they were very much dependent on where in the project a firm was operating. And I'll come back to this shortly. Finally, we found that small scale projects presented more opportunities for innovation and upgrading. Um, and as we found that small firms conducted uh, functional upgrading, moving from focusing on one type of project offering to a whole different type of project offering. But as I said um, earlier, at the large scale, there was very little innovation, and that's partly because of the location of firms in, in the project uh, process, that they ended up maintaining the same firm 
um, f the same position in projects um, in, in all in, in all cases. So we found that location in the project mattered a great deal, especially in large scale projects. For those only involved at construction or build stage, the skills and capabilities needed were routine in most cases, but there were some exceptions where firms took the opportunity and upgraded. What mattered most was who managed the project and how the project was managed. Specifically, we found that there was a lot more work needed to be done on the value of having an EPCM uh, style contract over just an EPC one. So we found that where a project was run um, using an EPCM contract, that we were we saw more local contractor involvement. EPCM here means um, engineering procurement construction management. So you have one firm that manages all the activities across the project. Uh, we found that where there was more local ownership and management of projects, there was perhaps obviously more involvement of local firms. However, in order to encourage this in new and future projects, uh, requires a set of skills in Kenya that are not abundant yet, namely skills in designing projects and also skills in managing projects. So our takeaway points from the work that we've conducted have been that a critical skills base can be created from investing in projects and these projects can do more than just ensure access to clean energy. We found that companies, firms that were involved in these projects, uh, built new skills, built the ability to upgrade into new areas of business um, and, and provided uh, training and expertise that went on and, and provided an opportunity to become experts in, in these particular project areas. But to really ensure that co-benefits from access to clean energy projects are achieved requires recognition of innovation in projects. Notably, more support to encourage innovation in areas of projects which currently lack innovation, particularly at the build stage, and the need to recognize that innovation occurs through linkages and partnerships which are facilitated by effective project management. And so this in turn um, highlights the importance um, of, of, the, of the need for critical project management skills training. So um, I'd like to stop there and say thank you very much for your time. Um, and I do need to appreciate Danita uh, for the funding for the project, uh, my fellow uh, project team members, interviewees, uh, and the project staff who supported uh, us through through these efforts. Um, I'm afraid that due to the online uh, nature of my participation, I'm unable to participate in the discussion, um, but uh, the project is ably represented by uh, Professor uh, Rasmus Lima, who is with you today in person. Uh, I wish you good deliberations and, uh, and look forward to, to hearing about them in due course. So that was the, the presentation of uh, Rebecca. And you can see that uh, the, the case of wind and solar and how it compares also with the case of uh, green hydrogen, how this sector is very important for, the, uh, for sizing these uh, windows of opportunity for the core benefits as uh, Rebecca was, was telling about. Um, now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Aiko Takemoto uh, we were talking about uh, uh, capacity building and um, need for capacity building. It will be now discussed at a, another level, but also related to capacity building. Aiko? Thank you. So may I have a seat? Yeah. Was, yeah, I think that microphone is working. But maybe... No? Okay. Do you need... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, but may I have some... Um, We can, if, I mean, we can have a round of questions and, and discussion sure. before okay. uh, you present, if you wish. No, maybe after. Okay. So I think it's quite late. Okay.
Hi, hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining. Um, thank you very much, the Chair. And my name is Akio Takemoto, Program Head of UNU Institute for Advanced Study of Sustainability based in Tokyo. So before introducing our unique um, education capacity building program to address uh, implement uh, uh, the issue on the Paris Agreement, I'd like to, may, may, I, may I have some, some um, comments? So you're, all of you pr uh, presentation are quite um, 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 interesting. So uh, first of all, um, as uh, Rasmus mentioned, um, for uh, late commerce um, in developing countries, Global South, it's uh, not easy to um, be uh, competitive for uh, advanced uh, green technology. So uh, in, in this case, we need to um, um, consider uh, the um, you know, carbon effectiveness uh, on um, whole supply chain. So uh, in, in uh, I, I acknowledge in developing countries, um, you know, upstream or downstream. In other words, um, uh, manufacturing or parts or materials or um, and, uh, treatment waste and recycling. Such industries um, strong uh, has a competitive advantage. So um, we, um, I wonder if we uh, could develop um, a business model, uh, how these um, um, uh, yeah, industries in, in, in uh, global south can contribute to uh, the green uh, jobs. Then um, from this context, um, I think uh, in addition to um, energy um, innovation, um, but also I think uh, it's a very important uh, option is nature-based solutions. So recent IPCC uh, assessment reports uh, highlights importance of demand side management for the uh, food, uh, food supply chain, global supply chain. So um, then there has a potential to have a, um, um, uh, five billion uh, over five billion tons of uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction globally by changing their diet uh, diet and uh, avoidance of waste from food. So, um, but in order to create a um, sustainable food uh, system, um, another technology, ICT, <laughs> to um, visualize um, the carbon emission, carbon footprint, uh, be very effective. So, I think um, there is uh, some kind of a specific role uh, for all countries, not only for advanced countries, uh, for all countries to uh, contribute to uh, the green job, I think. So thank you very much. So, sorry, my, my presentation is here. So um, I, I want to introduce our uh, recent project on the uh, postgraduate degree specialization on the Paris Agreement. So um, you and you, there are um, 14 research institutes across the world. So. Uh, the merit, Rasmus is uh, based in um, Netherlands, but uh, our institute is based in Tokyo. Then uh, we are doing uh, research uh, focusing on uh, sustainability, in particular environmental sustainability, such as the synergy between climate change, SDGs, biodiversity, water, and uh, innovation and education for sustainable development. Then uh, I'd like to highlight on um, the, our uh, unique postgraduate degree program. We have, our institute itself uh, provide the, the uh, master degree and a PhD degree uh, for the students. Uh, it, it is uh, unique uh, among uh, UN agencies. So currently uh, we have uh, 38 uh, students, 50% uh, is master, the other is a PhD, from 20 countries, out of it 76% from developing countries. And I want to um, uh, stress that uh, over 50% of students receive a scholarship uh, thanks to the contribution by Japan Foundation of UNU, Asian Bank, uh, European Bank, and um, Bristol Bank, it's a private bank, and others. Then we have a um, strong partnership uh, with major um, university based in Tokyo, such as University, uh, university of Tokyo, uh, through the credit exchange, double degree, and joint diploma system. Then, sorry, um, I will skip this. Um, then um, our um, program structure um, highlights um, the um, um, broad, holistic um, and education. Um, then, uh, utilizing our uh, you know uh, instructors' knowledge, uh, ranging from 
some, uh, governance, uh, climate change, biodiversity, water, and uh, educational system, then the students can learn uh, interdisciplinary knowledge uh, through the experience um, in two or three years. Then, um, so uh, under this current structure, um, based on the result of COP26, uh, that we were in the stage of, of uh, implementation. So uh, UNUIS um, announced to launch uh, the postgraduate degree specialization on the Paris Agreement uh, in collaboration with other uh, organization by uh, autumn next year. The concept of specialization is to develop future leaders of practitioners uh, who will implement actions for decarbonization and adaptation to climate change in various positions uh, of governments, private sector, and other stakeholders. So we, uh, as a UN agency, will be open to all countries, but however, we will prioritize developing country students. Then, um, yeah, there are um, different system um, uh, in, by country by country, but uh, um, based on the Japanese and, and credit system, uh, we will consider to um, uh, arise 30 credit for getting a master degree. Then uh, adding to the coursework, uh, we will set up uh, thesis or non-thesis courses. Then uh, we are uh, considering to develop um, the new courses uh, quite specific to uh, the implementation of Paris Agreement, such as overview of ENFCCC and Paris Agreement and history of negotiation and transparency system or uh, national planning or MRV uh, system and the carbon market mechanism, which is related to Article 6 of Paris Agreement. In addition, we will um, you know, modify the current um, you know, uh, interdisciplinary study on climate change, SDGs, and uh, biodiversity food system and nature-based solutions. Then, uh, as a practical so you, uh, our institute uh, will further de develop um, practicum courses in collaboration with our partner, uh, across the world. Uh, one example is to um, encourage students um, in Tokyo to participate in a project of a partner government uh, for developing a strategy or plan on the long-term low carbon development or climate change adaptation plan. Or the second option is to encourage part uh, students to participate in a project of a uh, uh, partner uh, for enhancing capacity on the transparency system or simply um, um, sending out students to present an uh, event or conference of uh, climate change and sustainable development agenda. Then, um, in terms of the research area, um, perhaps um, that would be applied to a PhD students, but we wonder if we uh, could in, uh, encourage the students to study an integrated assessment model uh, for climate mitigation that will facilitate um, the government, uh, particularly in developing countries, to formulate uh, carbon neutrality uh, action plans by 2050 and a carbon market mechanism, which is a hot issue at, uh, discussed at the COP, I think. So uh, we will uh, focus on this topic uh, under the master course and PhD. Okay, then this, these activities, uh, we, I believe, uh, contribute to um, the EMTFC's uh, Glasgow uh, work plan program on action for climate empowerment. So um, not only um, higher education, but also uh, we will um, you know, make efforts to empower high school students uh, who will be, uh, uh, yeah, will, will, uh, be the uh, uh, university students and uh, uh, you know, uh, practitioner in the future. That's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Aiko. So I think that was clear on the discussions that how is important the, the tech for this green window of opportunities, the policy aspect, and to have uh, people that are better in doing this policy, have better training, I think is uh, fundamental. I would like to open for the colleagues that are here, if you have any questions for us, please. Do, uh, this program? So, so, sorry, yeah, question to me? Yes. yes. Uh, sorry, one more, please. 
uh, if this program, it can be a sandwich program, for example, if we have a student in Brazil that is doing something similar, could this be a sandwich program with the United Nations? A sandwich, like to do start in Brazil and then completing in the, doing part of the work there and coming uh, back to Brazil can be done? No, no, no. Now students need to uh, start um, the study at uh, our institute in Tokyo, but uh, um, we, we are planning to um, establish um, practicum courses, in, for example, in collaboration with the University in Brazil, Okay. Or some some research institute uh, or other um, organization in other countries to send out the students um, then to to have experience uh, in project planning or something. Then we will uh, issue a certificate mm. uh, for the students. So you know, um, in the case of uh, our our student, they will utilize this credit for uh, the you know degree, but. Uh, it's not limited to the students in Tokyo, so other other part other students can join, of course. Thank you. Okay, okay. What well, the next thing will be? No, uh, yeah. okay. Please uh, go ahead. You sorry, I didn't catch your name. Is Clovis? Clovis, sorry. Yeah. Clovis. Uh, I, I would just point out exactly what Professor Eko did. I mean, if we look at the, and we are talking about the. Carbon incentives for doing the the green uh, hydrogen, right? So when we look at what happens with the Kyoto Protocol in terms of uh, developing the developing countries, uh, we we have uh, this transfer of technology. For example, I, I, I will talk about the Brazil. We we, we uh, during the CDM we had 50, 60 percent of our projects were on the uh, photovoltaic sector, and we have one of the cleanest grid energy in the planet. So that this push of technology, it it, it does a, what Professor says. It, it doesn't create green jobs in our countries. And and then when we start looking at this, I mean, you start saying you, you change the polluted industry to the developing countries. But when they come to developing countries, for example, in Brazil, this industry won't be that polluted. The, our matrix, our energy matrix is clean. So if you send a polluted industry from Europe over there, it will be less, huh? you have less pollution. Professor just uh, said about the agri-food, the, the change in Brazil, they produce food with carbon credits. We don't have emissions attached to it. It's because of the, the, the land cultivation. And, and not only that, he mentions 5 billion tons per year on saving on the production chains. I mean, if we start doing improved forest management on tropical forest, we can have more than that. I mean, we have 120 billion tons of CO2, CO2 stored on our hardwoods. Those hardwoods could be sell broadly all over the globe and they will be growing again. But what I'm trying to say is, I, I, I don't see this technological transfer being a lot, bringing a lot of uh, opportunities to advance our economies or our societies at all. I mean, if we can have industry over there that will, uh, instead of exporting soybean grains, for example, if we have an industry that, that, that could process that, you know, aggregate value, that this industry will be less polluted. And then the, the food and the whatever is nature-based products that we have that will be exported, they will be exported to other countries with carbon credits. So that, that would be something that we would be very interested for developing countries. That, that was just the line that I would right. no, Thank you very much. Uh, let's just take another one and then we respond to that. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle Peña from the GIZ. So we just published uh, a study on the lessons learned. Well, we're in the process of publishing. <laughs> uh, a study on lessons learned um, of the NEC update cycle. And we've seen actually like this huge need of like bringing academia into the whole NDC development process. And it's about like not only MRV systems, it's about building capacities. So I was very pleased to learn today that there are already efforts from the uni uh, universities here like to actually create these capacities. My question is, however, this is a very punctual start. Are you 
having do you have any networks in place where you can actually like build capacities of the academic institutions in the country to work closer with the governments because i think when it comes down to data collection for instance or technology transfer there is still a huge gap and there are good examples in some countries but still i feel that one of these bottlenecks <laughs> um, still need to be tackled if you want to be successful in like policy development processes thank you Oh, thank you for the question. Um, any, any other questions? So if not, let's uh, respond to that. Uh, we would like to, 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 to respond. I can start first Please. and I'll pass to you. So let me start then with the case of Brazil. I think you are totally right on, of course, on your comments there. I'm also Brazilian, so I, I know the case. But uh, the, the, what I think is important is that the situation of each country is very different. While the energy matrix in Brazil is very clean, as you said, when you go to other developing countries of similar size or GDP, may not be the case for historical reasons and how the development, you know, technology develop and so on. So uh, it, it's very particular. But even when you consider the cases that you gave that uh, um, w when you have the, the industry going to the country to produce clean energy may not be uh, producing to that many jobs in a particular thing, but when you consider the whole value chain of the backward linkages and forward linkages, then there are many opportunities for that. I think what we are trying to say is that what are the opportunities for countries that don't have um, the the situation that you were describing for Brazil, for example. What are the opportunities that they have to use these technological revolutions, not only to be the users of the technology, not only to be the user of the technology to, to green their matrix, but also to use that to, to create uh, new sectors, to diversify their economies, to be able to be more competitive and to be able to catch up and, 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 and close that gap. So I think that is uh, the key. But I, I totally agree with you. It's not only the case of the country, it's what is the sector. Well, it's very sector-based. So you, if you tell me, would countries benefit from these windows of opportunity? We have to ask, okay, which country? Which sector you're talking about? And uh, you, know, you have to be very specific to, to be able to give a, 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 an, an, an assessment on that. I think I will stop here, but uh, 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 Roberta? Yeah, uh. yeah thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just would like to, to follow up uh, um, what uh, uh, Clovis just said. Uh, I mean, because uh, there are many cases of countries in which, uh, uh, I mean, both advanced and developing countries in which uh, this idea of build of, uh, for instance, of green transition is seen just uh, from the point of view of creating a market uh, and not uh, be, I mean, the, here the point is that uh, 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 there is a need for uh, um, for uh, an intervention at the demand side and the supply side. For instance, uh, a, a case uh, um, which is very much on the news uh, in these days is Vietnam. Vietnam is uh, uh, I think the country in the world which in the last uh, year or two years uh, had been uh, growing more uh, quickly in terms of uh, moving uh, uh, to renewable energies. So they have created a huge market for, uh, for instance, the solar industry. But this has been created mainly with incentives for foreign investment. So this is not creating uh, uh, domestic capacity uh, in uh, any uh, segment of the value chain. Because, for instance, the, the solar PV case is typical. I mean, uh, we know that most of the solar panels come from China or from Malaysia. So probably this uh, segment of the value chain is taken. But then uh, if you um, analyze the solar value chain, there are many different segments in which uh, there is still pay space uh, for building up uh, uh, production and technological capacity. And Vietnam is not doing much on, on that direction, which is typical of Vietnam because Vietnam uh, 
has been very successful in terms of attracting foreign investment, but then there are, uh, I mean, moving to a completely different industry, mobile phone is, uh, I mean, Huawei as the largest uh, uh, production plant uh, in the world in Vietnam. If you go and and and, and search how many domain, how many Vietnamese uh, suppliers uh, Huawei has, uh, are less than less than uh, maybe uh, ten or so. So I mean, uh, of course, uh, very good because it's created a lot of jobs, but uh, is not uh, uh, somehow moving up to the next stage of development as uh, instead for its China has done in, uh, in the last uh, decade or so. Thanks. So I would like to tackle the, the question on the capacity, perhaps. Uh, I would like to respond to both. If yes. I may. Uh, do you? Uh, yes. yes. Is this okay? Yeah. Um, well, yes. So uh, first to uh, the gentleman from, from Brazil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I, I will do that. I um, to conclude. No, I mean, uh, just to, to put it very shortly, I mean, of course, when we are talking about capacity building in, in these areas, um, we are talking about a lot of, of technical expertise, um, and also in terms of, of, of what you've just outlined. I think in terms of the specific discussions that we've been having uh, in this session, um, also, of course, it's very specific in terms of sectors and technologies and so on. But I think that at least a starting point for this um, is to think about what uh, I was talking about, which is bringing together policymakers from uh, Ministry of Environments, uh, Ministry of Energy, and policymakers from uh, um, from Ministry of Industry, because you know this point about co-designing uh, of policies for uh, exploiting uh, these opportunities in the green economy, I think is absolutely uh, essential. And I've been talking to several people uh, around in policy communities, and they're saying, you know, all of these processes always work in silos, and what we need to do is exactly to, to, to bring this together. Um, so, in fact, I've been thinking about developing such a course at UNU Merit uh, in Maastricht, um, and it could be, uh, you know, for people in the UN system, uh, but of course also from, from local governments uh, across the global south. Now, uh, such a, uh, a course would need to be, uh, to be funded, so uh, we, if we could come up with some kind of, you know, collective uh, business model for, uh, for this, that could be of great interest. So anybody in this room uh, interested in this kind of, of effort, uh, please do reach out. I think that we, we have to finish now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, you all, for being here. And uh, thank you, colleagues, for the participation. So um, uh, with that, we conclude the session. Thank you very much. Thank you.